What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo with Mike Golick Jr. That is me. With me, as always, super producer extraordinaire Brandon Newman on the ones and twos. My father, Mike Golick Sr., and back for another Wilder Wednesday, actually on a Wednesday this week, Charlotte Wilder. Charlotte, how we feeling? How we doing? I'm feeling great, Mike. I feel like having a Wilder Wednesday on a Wednesday is actually the least characteristic thing I can do at this point. You know, I'm going to add to this because, and, and again, I just, off air, I just jumped you both for getting on me because I'm a little older. I thought it was Thursday. I'm, I, I I am not going to lie. Oh. I thought I was sitting here and I thought it was Thursday. You said a Wilder Wednesday. I said, wait a minute, it's Thursday. So she's on Thursday because last time she was on on a Friday. Then I said, she's on any day but Wednesday. Yet, I just, today is Wednesday. Okay, can we start this whole thing over or no? Is that the worst feeling in the world is <laughs> when you think you're a day further ahead in the week? The worst version of that is when you think it's Friday and it's only Thursday, but oh, Wednesday yeah. into Thursday as the halfway mark equally is debilitating, Charlotte, equally is debilitating. It's true, but I've had the opposite, Mike. I thought today was Tuesday. Until I realized today was the day that I do the show. And because it's called Wilder Wednesday is the only reason I know what day it is. But then I mess that up for everybody by showing up on days that aren't Wednesday. So time is a social construct and we have absolutely no idea what's going on is the message that I'm picking up here. So let me ask you, and I want you to be honest, okay? We're, for, we're all friends here. So when you realized it wasn't Tuesday and it was Wednesday and you had to do a Wilder Wednesday, I want you to tell me your initial reaction. Was it yes or, oh, God? Oh, yeah. Well, I realized it last night. Last night I realized it wasn't Monday. It was Tuesday. So I had time to <laughs> actually prepare for the show. And I was very excited. You know, I mean, I get very excited for everything, but I get most excited to do the Gojo show with you guys and – I'm not even embarrassed about how much I'm pumping you up. So don't let it go to your head. I, I appreciate that. With great power comes great responsibility. And to that point, Dad, I remember this from our time doing morning radio about how, like Charlotte said, this is a marker for some people in the week. They hear Charlotte's voice. They know it's Wednesday. They can go on comfortably. I remember some nights when different sporting events would go different lengths of time. The early morning show that I was on first and last, which was from 4 to 6 a.m. Eastern. So again, early morning routine, truck drivers, coaches, people that are going into you know the gym early. And sometimes they would extend it by an hour and I would have to get on air in that first hour and gently remind people every time you're not late because you're hearing my voice right now we are early this isn't your fault we are not where we're supposed to be because man you throw off the delicate ecosystem a little bit and dad you were a part of people's morning ecosystems for 20 years that's a very precarious situation well i mean because people are used to routine especially a morning show and doing it for a couple of decades obviously I was in a routine, but everybody, I'm with you. You know, for our show, because it was radio and TV through all the years, that, most of the years at ESPN, people would get up in the morning and turn on the TV like it was a radio, go about their morning business, then turn us on in their car. So, yeah, if anything threw that off that early, you don't want the ecosystem tweaked at all early in the morning. You want everything to run smooth. If anything's going to happen to you to tweak your day, it's got to be after noon. And the morning's got to be sacred to you and your routine. That's what I think anyway. Yeah, no, I would tend to agree, which is why it's good that the Boston Celtics did what they did last night so as not to Oops. ruin Charlotte's morning. They just ruined her evening. Um, Charlotte, what like DEFCON level are we at? I always mess them up, and I'm never sure if one's the worst or five's the worst, but where are you coming off the Celtics getting blowed the hell out at home? First of all, thank you for that segue, Michael. That was so lovely. I feel amazing. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the, uh, little. Uh, I'm so mad. I was so mad watching that, <laughs> watching that, watching that basketball game. I was like yelling at the television, and then there are three minutes left, and they're down what twenty sixteen, whatever it is, and and I'm like, I'm like, well, maybe there's still. I'm like, crazier things have happened. Like, there's still a chance. Like, you know. Maybe and they're the only bench players in the game. I'm like, it could be Peyton Pritchard. I'm like, Peyton Pritchard could make ten threes in a row. You never know. So I was at like the bargaining stage, 
And I know that everybody hates Boston and that everybody's gloating and everyone's so thrilled at my pain and love seeing Joel and B league MVP go off, do his thing, had a great game, blah, blah, blah. Congrats. Happy for him. Um, but this feels very bad. This feels very bad. And it feels very bad because you can look at all the stats and the box scores and blah, blah, blah. But I think there was, there was something just visually about watching the Celtics last night that was so depressing. They would like create, a, they would like roll out a red carpet for Tyrese Maxey and be like, oh no, no, like, do you want to shoot? Do you want to shoot a three or would you like to just go right to the basket? Like you tell us. And it was very, very depressing. So I'm, I still have some hope, but I'm at DEFCON like close to, I'm either at DEFCON two or DEFCON four if one or five is the worst. Yeah, you're, you're looking, looking at right Boston. Now they're hundred. Sure. Th- yeah, they're, they're Boston scored 103 points. That's the lowest this postseason, which may have added to this tweet from Charlotte last night at 9:01. Went out to dinner and asked for the check early because I had to get back to the Celtics game. And the server said, "It's not that Boston fans are stupid, which they're not. Uh, they're just thin-skinned and bad at being sports fans." And let me tell you that that's that, that's almost lost. As you said, the guy almost lost his love tonight. I'll say this, Charlotte. Tell me where he's wrong. Tell, tell, mm. I mean, I think he pegged mm. you Boston fans just right. You want to do this? We Okay, Boston fans, you cannot say we are bad fans. You cannot say Boston fans are bad fans. You can say we're obnoxious. We're not. We, we are good at being sports fans because we are obnoxious. We are insufferable. We are, and, and, and he said this to me and he was like, his evidence, he was like, yeah, I once went to a Mets game and there were these fan these Boston fans behind us and we weren't being mean and they were, and they were just like probably embarrassed at how enthusiastically we were cheering. And I said to him, I was like, oh, well maybe you should act like you've been there before. And my fiance was like, I think we need to leave. <laughs> I literally <laughs> got in a fight with this guy. So, I mean, Charlotte, I, I you, you may not remember because you were three or four at the time, the same age as Mike. Most of my years were in Philly. We know, I know what fans can be like. And I never said the Boston fans were bad. Just like I would never say the Philly fans are bad. I think they're both very smart fan bases, but they're very, what's a nice word? Engaged? Is that a nice word? I mean, they're nutcases. They're, they're crazy, and both can be thin-skinned. You, you can get under both their skins. They'd be ready to fight at the drop of a hat. I never said they were bad, but I think the server's explanation of them is right on, and, and, and that can be a good thing. You have very passionate fans. Again, another better word to use than one I probably can't say. Yeah, I think that's kind of where we've arrived at is, and really it's the tri you know. I would say the tri-state area of Pennsylvania is not totally in that, but like Philadelphia fans and Boston fans and diehard New York fans are just the triple way Spider-Man pointing meme when it comes to sensitivity about their teams. The difference really is, is Boston fans have all of the championship pedigree to fall back on. And it's the thing that everyone else hates most about them is the fact that a lot of the same complaints are coming where in Philadelphia, you have got the 76ers team that beat Boston trying to exercise a bunch of modern postseason demons, still trying to shake off the remnants of the process. Joel Embiid, trying to see if he can get to the Eastern Conference Finals for the first time in his career, and knowing there's been droughts in that city. Obviously, the Eagles have helped erase that in recent years, the Phillies, but then you've got the Mets, the Jets, that side of New York football that's also been without this. And so when they hear Patriots fans, Celtics fans, Bruins fans, complaining about the way things are, knowing the way things have been, that's, I think, where some of the disparity falls in here, Charlotte. And I think that's even where you'd admit you guys probably differ a little from everyone else's, complaining from a bit of a perch. Oh, totally. I think I think we're totally obnoxious and thin skin. Like that wasn't what I took issue with the fact that he said we were bad at being sports fans. I was like, if there's one thing we're good at, it's yeah. it's that. But I do think, you know, from from a from an unbiased perspective, um, I think first of all, it's sort of insane. Like anytime I hear Eastern Conference Finals for the first time in Joel Embiid's career, I'm shocked because it's hard to imagine that this guy has been so good and hasn't made it. So of course, as a sports fan. You want him to get there. You want that team to get there. I mean, Tyrese Maxey is so fun. I, I really love so watching this team. From a Celtics fan, fan perspective, it's a little bit heartbreaking because they've been so close since, what, 2018? 
And so it feels like if not now, when? And 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 those two things are sort of in direct competition with each other, and it's breaking my brain a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You, you again. You don't have bad fans. Philly doesn't have bad fans. I'll tell you who is in a second. But real quick, if Philly can get by this next game, it's the first time they've gotten this far since '01. And the hump they got over last night, the last two times they were 2-2 in a series, they lost by 36 and then lost by 35. So this time they they obviously swung it the other way. And I'll tell you where bad fans are, and they get ticked at me every time I say this, is Miami. Uh, listen, I spent one year in Miami in 93. We had the best record in football at 9-2, and two, the best record. And we our games were blacked out. We couldn't sell out the stadium. And we came from Philly. My wife would go sit in the game in Miami and go, what, what is going on here compared to the Philly fans? Those are, are I, apathetic fans down there when they don't show up for their team. And they yell at me every time I say that. But you know what? Proof was in the pudding that year. Best record in the league. We couldn't even sell out the joint. And had Dan Marino as a quarterback. Until they got hurt. I will say the one place that they got a win for me was when they came out to Los Angeles for their game against the Chargers this past year. Dad, you were calling it on Sunday Night Football, and I looked around that stadium, and that was a Dolphins home game in Los Angeles. That's true. And I was amazed that all of the jokes about Chargers fans not really existing came true. So uh, <laughs> that's maybe the stoppable force meets movable object of fan base uh, situations there. But, Dad, you mentioned it. This was – simultaneously the Sixers getting over the hump, but also a crossroads for the Boston Celtics. And I think that's what I really want to look at is what comes next if this does go sideways for Boston. So the Boston Celtics got deleted on their home court. They're on the brink of extinction. Um, It does not look sweet around there. And I guess now as Philly's sort of realizing their hopes and dreams, right? James Harden, kind of getting to exercise some of his own postseason demons, not having to be fully relied on, getting 30 points from a guy like Tyrese Maxey, playing with the MVP and Joel Embiid. It's all sweet around there, and it seems to fit. Like, we're seeing after that one game back when Embiid came off the injury and Harden looked a little out of sorts, the parts have generally tended to fit there. On the other side in Boston, it's fascinating to look at this situation because I've seen J.J. Redick talk about it. We've seen it with our own eyes. Late game execution, been an issue for Boston. You got 60 points between Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown last night, but it wasn't enough with the rest of that supporting cast. And now as we come up on the brink of the offseason, and Charlotte, I I would start with you on this since you're our Celtics fan, What do you think the future looks like for this core? Is Joe Mazzulla, who got the interim tag taken off, got an extension that we can't really find many details about the length or the cost of, or Jalen Brown and the impending you know free agency? I think after the 2024 season, uh, he's eligible. I think he's coming into the last year of his deal now. But what does the future of this core look like? Do you think both of the people I just mentioned are here when we tip off next season? I don't know. I mean, I feel like with Joe Mazzulla, who until the last two, until this series had seemed sort of like a wonderkind, um, you know, he and I are the same age. And when I try to put that in perspective for myself, I think of like, he could be, he could have been sitting next to me in math class in fourth grade. And like that sort (laughs) of, um, you know, but I think that he did, he has a contract extension. They removed the interim tag in February. Um, I guess if you have a team this good and if you'd gotten so much out of your bench players before, like in the early rounds of the playoffs, they looked so deep. And now Tatum and Brown and Marcus Smart last night to a certain extent were really the only guys who showed up. And that is rare. You know, the team had been, whether it's Time Lord Robert Williams getting every possible rebound, he only had two last night. And so clearly something is not working at this point and i don't know if because of missoula's age because he came in with the interim tag if that means it's easier to say like well this is your fault man like we had all the pieces we were ready to go and it just fell apart so you've got to leave as for jalen brown i think that's going to be a more interesting nebulous situ- nebulous uh situation <laughs> just because he you know there was all of that off-season stuff last year about saying that they wanted to maybe get rid of him and he was hurt by it so i i don't know but if they lose it certainly feels like things have the potential to go very very south very quickly i listen i'm i'm a fan of jalen brown i think his game is really common it's been tatum and brown obviously i think brown is getting 
you know, is, is pushing that envelope to Tatum. Um, not there yet, but I, I love, and by the way, love the black mask with the full beard. He looks like a superhero. It's actually very, very cool. Again, he's, what, well, I think he's 26, Tatum's 25. We know Horford, that's going to end at some point. He's 36. So I, I would think they want to keep, you know, the core of this together. And we, we know this in all sports, right? The easy thing to do is to fire a coach. Here, you were handed a, a great team, a ready-made championship team. A team last year, by the way, that was down, what, 3-2 to Milwaukee, and they came back and won that series. So they've done that before. So if they don't do that, what's the easiest thing to do at times, right, is to move on from a coach, and it could be, well, this was an interim coach who we removed the tag from, so there wasn't a lot invested in that, so let's move on from that because we have all that talent. That that wouldn't shock me. Again, it's fuzzy on the details we're trying to find of the extension and where it was, but that really is, hasn't stopped people in the past, owners in the past, from axing someone if they feel that while you had the talent, while your window is open to make some hay. Yeah, I, I'd say this because in general with the Jalen Brown stuff, so he'd be eligible. The Celtics can pay him the most, as is the case with a right. lot of these modern yes. NBA contracts. It'd be five years and approximately $290 million. So that's God. hard to say no to. And I was on the wrong side of history the last time we did the should we break Jason Brown, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum up conversation. I was the idiot that said, yeah, you need to break them up. This isn't working. And then – um, Ime Yudoka came over and revived them in the middle of a season and the rest was history. So I think that's a guy, you're right, Dad. Those players are so supremely talented, so gifted, especially on the wings that you got to keep them together, I think, if you've got the opportunity. The Joe Missoula thing's interesting because you're right. The easy thing is to saw off the coach. The hard thing is to say, hey, we knew this was a possibility, right? He's doing this for the first time. He came on and took this role in very adverse sets of situations. It was a startling takeover at the beginning of the season because of everything that happened with Ime Yudoka. And you spent most of the year jockeying with Milwaukee for the one seed in the Eastern Conference. And that was considered by far the stronger conference. You had these three great teams up top. And so it's like what we do with players. Players right now where we're having a really difficult time legislating how much stock we should put into what you did in the regular season what you accomplished there versus what's going on in the postseason and maybe you could say yes while it is unfortunate that we are squandering what we feel like are good a good year with this core coming off that run that we just had it's not quite like what milwaukee just went through with mike budenholzer right. where the writing had been on the wall for a while they weren't so committed to that but then he won a championship and so things change with this it's yeah you've been knocking on the door nearly the same length of time but you're doing it with a coach that's learning a lot of these things for the first time dad we went through this with Notre Dame this year Marcus Freeman guy we had a lot of hope and a lot of promise in but you knew there were going to be some mistakes along the way that come with someone sitting in this chair at a team with this level of prestige for the first time and so I'd wonder if hey maybe you run it back and say this is a valuable learning experience and if this team really does rock with Joe Missoula behind closed doors and is with them in all the ways you need a team to be bought into their coach maybe this would be an overreaction just based off an uncomfortable feeling right now. And that's what we don't know. We don't know the inner workings of the locker room and how the players feel about them. Are they riding with them or whatever? But the one thing I we have seen is we always think winning championship buys you time. Well, we had the stat the other day in the NBA, what, three of the last four guys who won the title? Those coaches are gone. You know, Budenholzer, I believe, being the last one of those. Vogel was one of them, and I forgot who the other one was. The only one still there is Kerr. So it doesn't buy you as much time as you think it's going to buy you. So that that's the big thing, Mike. You're right, and that's something we don't know. What's the behind-the-scenes look uh, with Missoula and this team? And, and you mentioned that turnover has created an interesting kind of dynamic in this NBA postseason. And so I want to look at that. The question that I think is hanging over everything going on right now in the NBA playoffs as we sit here uh, waiting for the rest. All right, so before we get to uh, my dad's latest round of show and tell for the day, uh, he's back in his childhood house, my grandma Kate's house. There is memorabilia everywhere, and we've had him rummaging through all of his things, trying to find us goodies. He's got some more picked out today. Apparently, that involve me, so I'm a little worried about that. Um, 
I did want to ask this question because we were talking so much about the Celtics and Sixers game where the 76ers looked like the best version of them we've seen in the playoffs, right? Maxi going off for 30, Embiid looking like the MVP, Harden, you know, contributing in meaningful ways in between the cracks. We also had the Denver Nuggets blow out the Phoenix Suns last night at home. Nikola Jokic and Matt Ishbia, the uh, owner of the Suns, making peace before the game. We went over there yeah. and tossed him the ball in reference to the play that got him fined twenty five grand. I wanted to ask you guys, because it feels as wide open as ever, who do we think the actual best team in the postseason remaining is right now? Because I don't think we've got the usual big bad situation that we've had in the NBA for years. Like Charlotte, it just knee-jerk reaction when I say that. Who comes to mind for you right now? I mean, two, there are two knee-jerk reactions at the opposite sides of the spectrum. Part of me thinks the Nuggets, just because of how absolutely dominant they've been. And part of me thinks that the Heat could sneaky keep this going. I think, in in my opinion, Jimmy Butler, I know his stats aren't the best of everybody, but what he's been doing is this superhuman pulling together of a team. And you've got Eric Spolstra, who is just so competent. Like, And, and I say that as the highest possible compliment because he has been there. He knows how to do it. He is getting incredible play out of guys who went undrafted on his bench. It's unbelievable. I don't want everybody on the Levitard show in Miami to hear this and clip this and use this against me when the Celtics are not in the playoffs anymore. But I I do think that that is not the correct answer, but I think that there's a feeling around it that I would not count them out. But I think the real answer is probably Denver. Yeah, well, and I think the, uh, you know the, the Heat thing, Dad, is driven by the Jimmy Butler factor that Charlotte just said, right? He yes. looks like he could be yes. the best player left in the postseason, and so often that's what we equate it to. But what was your thought? Oh, I, I think Philly's the, the top team. You know, I, I look at Miami, and, I, and obviously it's very cool what they're doing. And, and again, we may have an eight seed and a seven seed in each conference move on from the play-in tournament the first time we've had to make the playoffs, and now both may be in their respective conference finals. The Lakers, you know, I'm still, uh, God, AD, LeBron, especially AD. You know, you still cross your fingers that nobody gets nicked in that one, but they've looked really good at times. Golden State, we've seen them look really good and really bad. Denver, I like Denver, and I don't think anybody gives them credit because they've been up near the top and haven't closed the deal yet. But they've won no games on the road on the, the, this in this series. They've all been home wins against Phoenix, and Philly has won on the road. Philly has proved that they can win on the road. You have, you know, Joel Embiid, who is just a monster right now. Third straight games with 30 points in this series. That's just below Allen Iverson in 01, who had five straight, and Wilt, who had four straight in 1965. And by the way, I can't believe Wilt is second in a stat somewhere. That just blows my mind. That guy is normally uh, first in everything. So I like what they're doing. I'm a huge Maxi fan. Harden, you know, you're going to get 45 or you're going to get the distributor. You're not sure which one you're going to get uh, out of him. He had a two-game horrific shooting uh, uh, situation. But I, I kind of am hoping that the matchup is the 76ers because I like big men play. And look at the big men you have in this if it's the 76ers with Embiid, your MVP. Then if it's, if it's Denver, you have Jokic, the last two MVPs. Or if it's L.A., you have A.D., who's been a monster since LeBron got hurt and in, in the postseason. But if you ask me to pick one right now, I say because they're winning on the road against good teams, I'm going to go with the 76ers. Yeah, man, the, the big man renaissance really has been fun to watch. And we said yes. that's sort of emblematic yes. of what we've seen in the MVP race where Giannis, who is a big man, albeit a stretch big man, but a big man nonetheless, that trinity has kind of been the group for a while. It, it really is fascinating how they've all evolved. You look at the stats in the playoffs right now. Anthony Davis leading the playoffs in rebounds per game, leading the playoffs with almost four blocks per game. And then you've got Nikola Jokic, who's second in the postseason in assists per game. It's insane what the these guys are all capable of, but I think it's Denver. And, and I think Denver is so fascinating because this is who they were in the regular season. Like we talk so much. And I heard Timmy Legler talking about this on ESPN the other day. You could argue the NBA season now starts at the trade deadline. 
Like, really, we've talked yes. about the devaluing of the regular season, but what you do and how many people use that as the marker. Not Christmas Day where it used to start, that the NFL's now big footing hard as hell, but the trade deadline where people retool, people do what the Lakers did, people do what the Mavericks did and try and bring over a star, and then gauging it from there. Denver's basically been the wire-to-wire number one in the Western Conference, and they've done it having all these guys healthy, and Jamal Murray finally being back, which, boy, oh, boy, that scare for them last night, watching him oh, almost roll yeah. an ankle. Had yes. to be a little yeah. bit of a reality check of how perilous the situation can be. But I look at how consistent they've been with that same core. You had, you know, guys like Aaron Gordon showing up big last night. Um, you know, uh, I think they've been in that Porter form did. for so long that I trust them. Yeah, Michael Porter having a great game last night as well as the name I was searching for. But yeah. I-, I think that consistency over time is something that I would have the most trust in, even if. You know, top end output wise, yeah, Embiid's probably more capable of taking over a game in that way. But even as I say that, I, I mean, Nikola Jokic went off for 53 points the other night, so it's not like he's yep. incapable of that either. And I, I would put my chips down with the team that showed us this is who they are for as long as we've had this season. Well, we're also going to get the nice matchup if they if they move on to their winning the series of Jokic and AD. I mean, that's in the Western Conference Finals. That's that's going to be a show without a doubt. I'm looking forward to that one if it if it comes. By to the fruition. way, Dad, you mentioned you mentioned Wilt before too. I'd be remiss that Wilt being down on some list. When I saw that Nikola yes. Jokic passed Wilt Chamberlain for triple doubles by a big man in the postseason, yep. I thought for sure it was going to be him leapfrogging into the number one spot. Do you guys have any idea who Jokic is now tied with at fifth for most playoff triple doubles amongst bigs? Wow. Oh, sorry. Most fifth most playoff triple doubles. Period. It's not just amongst big. So amongst anybody, right? He is tied with a member of a current playoff team for fifth most. There was a guy in the current playoffs that had more playoff triple doubles than he did. Still in the postseason right now. I mean, you're looking at Steph, LeBron. Draymond Green, Draymond. He is now tied for fifth all-time, according to ESPN Stats and Info, with Draymond Green, Rajon Rondo, Larry Bird, and Jason Kidd. So, I, respect listen, I, to Draymond Green, who has yeah. been in the postseason long enough to accumulate some stats like this. I, I'd like to know how many of those triple-doubles he had more rebounds than points. And I don't really mean that in a mean way, because that's a dude that does all the dirty work, right? And I love a guy like that. So, that, that I would I would have taken me a while to get to, to Draymond Green. I think the thing about Jokic too is that he is the sec- he has the second most rebounds and second most assists per game in this postseason. Um, and when you com- when you combine that with also going off for over fifty points in a game, it starts to become you know there- there's a completeness to that. That if he doesn't show up in one arena one night, he'll show up in the other. Clearly, um, so when I said. When I said Miami, I I want everyone to know I'm not an idiot. Like, I just have a spooky feeling. I have a spooky feeling about sometimes in sports, there is something really weird that happens. And I have a spooky feeling that if if that is going to happen, it's going to be with Miami. Um, I also feel like that's not true. But I just wanted to qualify that. It's like, I'm not I'm not no. saying this is true, but I'm saying there are moments in sports where you get a little bit of a tingly feeling of like, something we're not expecting could happen here. Because everybody who's good is being good. But also like, is there that point where everything falls apart, like we're seeing with the Celtics, and maybe setting the bar low to start, you can just keep building. Well, as Charlotte, I think you accounted for the other factor in this that we don't talk about unless we're talking about firing someone like Joe Missoula is, yeah, Spo does deserve a lot of credit for his influence around the team and coaching as we're seeing in that it's that Boston 76ers series is important. It's important in all these series. The Golden State Los Angeles series has been ripe with matchup changes and all these different lineup iterations for Golden State, how they've approached Anthony Davis and trying to account for him on the defensive end. That portion of things matters. And so 
when you've got a superstar like Jimmy Butler, who has been a postseason superstar, even if we don't consider him that overall in the rest of the year, and you've got Eric Spolster as your head coach, yeah, it does feel like you're walking into the party with a little bit more than most, because I don't know if any of us know enough about Mike Malone to feel like we're going to give him an advantage one way or another. Steve Kerr's obviously got all the championship pedigree. Doc Rivers right now is sitting in a situation that has to be deeply uncomfortable for people that are fans or have watched his teams of now having a lead in a postseason series that he could potentially blow in historically bad fashion. And so when you line all those up, giving credit to an Eric Spolstra coach team who has been kind of like NBA MacGyver right there alongside Jimmy Butler with the parts that he's made work, I don't think is all of that crazy. And that's kind of the point right now, Dad, with where we're sitting is the postseason lacks one real dominant force because outside of Denver, nobody else has been doing it for the entirety of this year. Nobody else has been so good with their, I guess, maybe Boston, but now we're seeing them reeling. But of the teams that we would consider for this right now, no one amongst Phoenix uh, has been doing it for the entirety of the year with the core yeah. they've got right now. The Lakers, the entirety of the year with the core they've got right now. The, you know, uh, I guess Golden State dealt with injuries during the course of the year too, but that's yep. at least a core that's been complete throughout this. And so I, I, it's hard to really look and see anyone as a through line that's heads and tails above everybody else. Well, yeah, if you talk consistent, consistency, you're talking Denver. And, and they're, they're on, they don't get the pub that, that, that everybody else gets, right? While you have a, a clear superstar in Jokic, you don't have – they don't fly high. And when they've been up – uh, near the top of the uh, of the conference, they haven't they haven't closed the deal, and that's what everybody's waiting for. Okay, you've been consistently the best team in the West. You're the number one seed. If you don't win it, what's next? You've proven you can be the best during the year. Then when you get to the playoffs, if you don't close the deal, then it doesn't matter. I mean that that's just how it is. You're you're built on championships in the NBA. It's quarterbacks in the NFL. And in the NBA, it's superstar players. You start getting graded on the amount of championships you have. And right now, they don't have any. What Jokic keeps doing, you know, is is putting himself in position to get technical fouls. I, I Last night was hilarious. At end of the third quarter, I think Devin Booker is shooting a, 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 a tee or something. He's over by himself. And the rest of the Suns are in a huddle right just on the court. And Bruce Brown... And Jokic walk over to the huddle. And Jokic even, the dude's a jokester, even said, I was trying to see what play they were drawing up. So Bruce Brown walks over there first. Then Jokic goes over there. And Durant shoves Jokic. And Jokic drew from his inner Matt Ishbia and, and, and had the flate and had the, whoa, you know, he, he, he what, what, I forgot what we call that. And say flopped. flopped. He definitely flopped. KD got the uh, T. Bruce Brown got a T. But that that's that's something that play and, and you do it when you're up big, right? Because at the end of the third, they they were up big in that one, uh, so you just you're like, okay, uh, we're gonna have some fun, you know, in this and and try and try and, and and do our thing and have a little fun and joke around. And obviously, if you're the team losing, you're not into fun as much. So KD gets the T and uh, and uh, Jokic, he is a bit of a joker. I think it's a good nickname for him. Well, he likes to joke ask- around. Ask that Denver Post writer who spends all of his locker room time wondering and wishing about what uh, Jokic's underwear is. And he'll definitely yeah, tell you. Yeah, exactly. He's a funny guy, yes. and he is the MVP of Budweiser <laughs> drinking folks everywhere, which is the most psychotic <laughs> headline I have read in such, yes. a, such a long time. So, um, yeah, a, 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 that's – I don't know. It, it's a it's an exciting place that I think we're sitting at with the NBA postseason right now, and seeing Joel Embiid now in position. Sorry, Charlotte, to have one of the MVPs get to a conference finals now did not feel like that award is cursed and bogged down by the regular season quota that it's got to fill. That we're seeing it translated to postseason success, so it feels like it's got a little more validity. And I think Jokic succeeding on that side helps with that too. Like that's an important factor of this because so much of the conversation around him potentially winning a third straight MVP was, well, he hasn't done it in the postseason. And now as they look like one of the more dominant teams set to potentially get to another Western Conference final for him, I think it's important at this juncture, especially we've talked about this league-wide for how this frames the discussion around the regular season that I don't think is just going to be saved by a midseason tournament that Adam Silver is trying to put out there. Um All right, so we've got plenty more NBA action coming up tonight that we'll be able to get to and break down. But, Dad, did want to take advantage of the fact that you're in a basement full of stuff that we haven't seen in a long time. 
Uh, again, uh, dad is back home in his childhood house. He's got knickknacks and doodads all over the place. Uh, we've been having you pull up for Mike Golick Sr.'s show and tell. Uh, you brought us yesterday your third place finish trophy from your senior year high school state wrestling meet. It is the darkest day of my dad's life, his worst sports memory. You can see the lost look in his eyes. He's still a broken man deep down inside. So, Dad, I hope today is less traumatic for you. Oh, today it's about you, Mike. Today we're going to have some fun with you as a child. And Charlotte, off air, you would ask for maybe a blonde picture of Mike. I'm going to get to that. But first, let's go to Mike's early athletic career, shall we? Mike, we know, is a monster fan of of lacrosse. This was Mike in middle school (gasps) playing lacrosse. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was a long stick defender. He was really good and, and, you know, used his physical size to – a whole lot, by the way, but uh, this is this is up on our wall down here. What do you think? Damn, strong, I love quite it. strong. I love the, the Avon, so Connecticut, like so the you've got that's a real New England vibe you've got going on there, and I don't know if that's a compliment to you because I feel like you've spent your whole life uh, trying to trying to run away from the New England vibe, but that's a that's a little bit of one, Mike. You know what? I, I actually, the further and further along I've gone, and maybe being away right now, distance made the heart grow fonder. I do appreciate that moment that I think was peak Connecticut, really peak Caucasity, was being a lacrosse player <laughs> in Avon, Connecticut. So, yeah, solid bucket there, decent follow through. Dad's right. I was way more uh, bull in a china shop than finesse player. I was a football player playing something in the offseason yeah. that would let me carry six feet of steel and then run into people as hard as I could. Yeah. So, Pretty solid you and your brother there, Dad. You've got, you've got more? Yeah, I have more. Yeah, you and your brother, Jake. Jake was big and fast, so Jake was a midi, and Jake just wanted to hit people. He ended up in the penalty box all the time, So, uh, but he had fun doing it. All right, so lacrosse, Mike, like, but obviously he went on to a football career. And here you go, Charlotte. Here's the early age of Mike in football. Oh, Ooh. my goodness. That is yeah. a powerful boy right there. That is the Simsbury <laughs> Avon like Chiefs that? version of my – I also didn't yes. know I wore 71 ever, which is <laughs> – it's not the worst number ever, and I think especially I was probably playing tackle or guard at that point kind of plays, but definitely not the most swagged out O-line number for sure. Look at you getting to the second level, though. Good job out of you. I appreciate me rocking the gloves. The important thing, and for anyone not watching this on the DraftKings YouTube channel, which you should be, we were in Chiefs colored uniforms, and I had the gloves with the fingers cut out, which was early O-line swag. As you evolve and become an adult and get into higher levels of football, you realize you want everything fully taped up for the most part. People that don't wear gloves are monsters capable of atrocities you've never even dreamed of. (laughs) But I think as much as anything, Dad, that was one of the few years that I could actually make the weight limit, which was the last time I had problem being the appropriate weight was in middle school where I had to spend one full year on the shelf because I was such a chonky little boy and too chonky for Connecticut middle school football. You you were, and I love when Jake talks about you as a little kid. Your mother gets so mad. Uh, But Mike was the kid, the young kid that would – I never – oh, yeah. I said Mike. Mike was the young kid that went uh, swimming in the pool that wore a T-shirt. He was that guy. He was that oh, kid. Oops! I f- oops! I Mike. fell in. Which is is what happens. I only ever played offensive and defensive line in Pop Warner football. I never played another position. Never played quarterback, running back, any of the cool positions. I was beef with my hand in the dirt from day one. So, Dad, that's a that's a great pull right there, and uh, deeply nostalgic for the time where I was the absolute best at football. There you go. All right, Charlotte, you wanted young blonde Mike yes. had, as he has no hair now, um, unless you look yes. at his uh, mugshot when he got arrested. He had a full head of hair, but very at a young age, Charlotte, this was the blonde hair that he had. <gasps> oh my oh. goodness! Oh my god! And and the overalls. Oh, and the frames. Oh, this is just peak. Peak nineties. So. This is this is speaking. <laughs> yeah, this is beautiful. This is and with a football. Oh my God, he's in a little football stance. The po- the <laughs> podcast audience. I have a, I have more blonde hair than you've ever seen on my head, and overalls on one side and a Canadian tuxedo on the other side. The nineties were in full effect there. <laughs> I so long for the days where I could pull off the Canadian tuxedo and great knee bend. Quite honestly, in that picture, hand on the football. 
it's no wonder I ended up playing center. So all of these uh, in show and tell, definitely uh, predictive. Predictive analytics going on in the form of baby pictures in my grandma's basement. Uh, shout out to my mom, uh, your wife, dad, uh, for reminding me that the 71 that I wore in that youth football photo that you pulled was actually during the Tony Baselli era in Jacksonville. So shame on me for slandering a number of one yeah. of the all-time greats and one of the few men that just physically eclipsed you from the earth whenever oh. you guys were together in person. That's a, my, my, my wife was probably happy like me that I retired when I did because the guys who came into the year into the league a year after I retired was Tony Baselli and Larry Allen. And that may not Jeez. have been pretty. So <laughs> I know I didn't need, I didn't need that smoke. <laughs> no, 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 Shout no. Out there Christine. are certain things. We love the real time feedback. Oh yeah. Always. <laughs> My mom has been shadow producing uh morning radio since 1998. So uh, she knows yeah. what she's doing. Um, uh, speaking of producing, let's move this thing along to the way we like to finish off each and every podcast, this, that, and the third, three quick stories to end your day. As always, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, and review, leave us a five-star rating. And we have seen the cries. I keep telling you guys every day, we understand, we hear you. We know you want Brandon back here singing. Brandon's got a lot on his plate in the producer chair right now. And again, he's good at this. So he wants more money to sing this song and he is in contract negotiations to try and make that happen. We support Brandon the same way we support the Writers Guild of America in getting more money yep. to do the things that you are good at. But we uh, sure do. let's get let's get to this, guys. We got the announcement, Dad. I know we talked the other day how for a player the schedule release isn't as exciting of a holiday as it is for fans. That being said, watching the slow trickle of information come out right now has got me really excited for football. And per Adam Schefter over at ESPN, we got reports about the international games that the NFL has announced for this upcoming season. So we've got five international games that are going to be taking place, three of them in London, two of them in Germany. And for the first time, we are going to have a team play back-to-back -back weeks in London. The Jacksonville Jaguars, who already now will own the record for the most appearances in London, this being their 10th and 11th games over there since the NFL started doing this, are going to play back-to-back -back weeks across the pond. They're going to play the Atlanta Falcons at Wembley Stadium on October 1st, and then a week later are going to play the Buffalo Bills at Tottenham Hotspur. So, Dad, if it wasn't obvious before, Roger Goodell really would like Jacksonville to just relocate permanently to London and do this thing. Well, I mean, listen, that, that, that's that been talk about making the game more international. They're, they're playing there, and as we'll get there, a couple of games in Germany as well. I did the game in Mexico City last year, but the thought is, would you have a a, a – international division where you would have you know they would have to be maybe in london uh, or a team relocated in london like in jacksonville would be the one so they would be in london while everybody else would be here i, I don't see that ever working i mean now you're, you're, you're taking families over there i mean it, there's there would be a lot to go through i don't think that will ever happen but the international games will keep happening for sure because those are always sellouts fans love when they come over there but I don't think it'll go as far as ever having a international teams or be an actual NFL team relocating to an international location. It begs have, the question though, Charlotte, what do you got? It's not, it's not called the international football league. It's called the national football league. So let's, mm. let's decide what we are here is all I'm saying. A little bit of decisiveness ah. might go a long way. Thank you. <clears throat> I will say, if given the choice, would you rather live in Jacksonville or in London? And while I understand not paying state tax is pretty cool, I went to Jacksonville. And no disrespect to our dear friend Emerson Lazio over on the sweat, but I've also been to London. And these pictures are not the same pictures. So maybe there's part of that that people would be willing to stomach in the name of living in a more metropolitan area. In a vacuum, there's no comparison. Yeah. I'd rather be in London. But unfortunately, this is not a vacuum. But they get a week out there. When, when I was playing, we played preseason games out there, not regular season games. And we would practice with our opponent all week out there. So two times, I went to London to play, and we were there for the entire week, which was fun, you know, when you hop around to the different pubs because it's an exhibition game. So who cares? <laughs> 
I love that the NFL's been doing this long enough, by the way, to where Jacksonville has actually become a prized commodity going overseas. You've got a team that's on the rise. You've got a young quarterback in Trevor Lawrence. They're going to get Calvin Ridley back to boost that room. Like they used to be the third party jersey that would just show up in the shot of every NFL game played over there because they were one of the first teams that we sent. And we sent them over there for like really bad ties with the Bengals and garbage performances that were not our best foot forward. And now we've gotten to the point we have lived long enough to watch the Jags actually be a value add to the people across the pond. So yeah. I'm excited for that because this means that there's chances that we get more Jags jerseys. Whenever the next time we have a coronation is, my dream is that we see Jacksonville jerseys in the crowd while they're getting ready <laughs> to announce a new king or queen. That it's is a, the world that I want It says like see. William <laughs> across the <Yeah>. back. <laughs> oh, there you go. Nice. Uh, my favorite sign that I saw in the crowd of the coronation for what it's worth is also he's just some guy and the only king we <laughs> acknowledge is the Burger King. So uh, <laughs> people never missing a moment to uh, bleep post in real life. Um, guys, let's get to um, the closest thing we have to monarchy uh, in that in the U.S. Apparently, the University of George Bulldogs have declined yet again a trip to the White House as a result of winning the national championship. Uh, Georgia received the invitation on May 3rd, uh, received on May 3rd an invitation for the team to visit the White House on June 12th. They said, unfortunately, the date suggested is not feasible given the student athlete calendar and time of year. We're appreciative and look forward to other opportunities for Georgia going forward. Now, we went back and looked. The last team to actually go, and part of this is pandemic related, was the 2019 LSU Tigers, where we got the Get the Gat video made inside the Oval Office with Joe Burrow and them boys. But, uh, Dad, is this a flex just because Georgia thinks they're going to have plenty of opportunities to go in whatever White House they want? See, I, I'm looking at the other way. Is this kind of a fad now where instead of saying, you know, we got invited to the White House, you know, damn the politics, it's cool to go to the White House, right? But now is everybody overthinking who's in the White House? You know, what are the politics involved? Should we go? Should we not go? I, I don't know where they are. Now, maybe they do have a, a scheduled conflict, but teams have been going to the White House for a long, long time, and Georgia now twice has not. So I don't know the reason. In all honesty, I don't care. I could care less if a team goes to the White House or not. But I just wonder if the thought process, Charlotte, is changing to, well, we better, This is this a political statement if we do this, as opposed to just like, man, I'm going to the White House. I've never been to the White House. I want to go to the White House. Well, you know, There were two decisive wins in Georgia, even though one person would not like to recognize one of them. So maybe there's a, a, you know, just a little, uh, a little political humor for you all on this uh, Wilder Wednesday. And when we actually remember it's a Wednesday, look what she is capable of, folks. Look what she is capable of. Uh, I'm with you guys, too. I have maintained maybe this is one of those things that also is just a trend that people don't care about nearly as much anymore. Maybe it doesn't have that cachet, which is why we need to send the winner of the national championship to area 51. This is my dream. Forget meeting a president. Let me meet them aliens and really kick this party off. Let's get to the third. um, And this is by far the weirdest story we'll share today. Robert De Niro is now going to be a father for the seventh time at 79 years old. To quote Hannah Waddingham from uh, her role as Rebecca in Ted Lasso, what are you, an effing character from the Bible? This is the weirdest thing ever. What are you doing? Like, just stop. Who? I also, I I read an article where he's quoted about his parenting style, and he basically says he doesn't like his kids. And that, to me, is like, well, then why do you keep having them, buddy? You don't have to. Nobody's, Nobody's making you do this. I, I listen, I, now that I have a grandson and the best thing about it is taking care of him for a little bit and then giving him back to his parents. I can't imagine being a, now how involved is he? I have no idea. Is he in there? Is he in there? You know, hand, hand in the dirt, changing diapers and everything and getting up in the middle of the night. I have no idea, but all I could think about is how friggin' tired I would. I was tired in my twenties when I had you goofballs. So let alone being sixty and having a kid, being seventy nine and having a kid. All I would do is sleep. I would want someone to put me out of my misery. It's so funny to think of him looking at the baby. Are you talking to me? Are you talking yeah. to us? <laughs> Download, subscribe, rate, review oh, the podcast. Check God. us out on YouTube. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>
Boom. Money in the bank.